Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the National Transit Institute, I thank you for participating in the Safety and Security Non-Rail non Mode Reporting Webinar. Can't speak. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. We are pleased to have Ann Singleton, Tim Edwards, and James Overbeek as our presenters today. Ann Singleton is a Senior Safety and Security Analyst for the NTD program since 2009. Anne has been involved with several STA initiatives, such as the State Safety Oversight Program, the Commuter Rail Safety Study, and the Transit Bus Safety and Security Program in a variety of roles. Prior to Anne's work with FTA, she was a software instructor and database developer. Tim Edwards is a data analyst for the Safety and Security module of the National Transit Database. He has been with NTD since December 2014. Tim is a graduate of the University of Virginia, where he received a Bachelor's of Science degree in, Ar in Architecture and spent two years as a transit operator for the University Transit Service. James Overbeek is a Safety and Security Analyst for the National Transit Database. He has been with NTD since September 2015. James graduated from Randolph-Macon College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Business and Economics. Today's webinar consists of Anne, Tim, and James presenting their material, followed by a question and answer session at the end. You can participate in the discussion by using the chat pod that is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. I know many of you have found that already. <laughs> I'll be monitoring the chat during the session, um, and we'll save your questions so that they can be addressed um, at the end or during the question and answer sections during the presentation. If you've not already printed out a copy of the presentation that was emailed to you, you can click on the handout document in the upper left-hand corner of your screen where it says Handouts to download, or you can copy and paste the link in the notes box also on the left-hand side of the screen. You can also email Andrea Lambert at a-n-d-r-e-l-a-m at nti.rutgers.edu, and she will be glad to assist you. I will now turn the presentation over to Anne. Thank you, Lori. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. The goal of today's session is to familiarize the NTD reporters with the safety and security reporting requirements and the individual reporting forms. We hope that the knowledge you gain today will make your job easier, and we sincerely appreciate your commitment to safety and security reporting. For those of you that report for purchase transportation providers, uh, please share this presentation with them so that they too are aware of what you need to report to NTD. So today we'll show you how to access the NTD system and navigate through the menus and forms. We'll discuss how setup is achieved and we'll review the safety and security CEO certification form, the SNS-20, the SNS-30 security configuration forms, uh, we'll also review the 2018 reporting clarification forms, uh, clarifications and form change, and we're reporting on the SNS-50 non-major summary report forms as well as the major event reporting. As mentioned, Tim, James, and I are your instructors for today. Joe Eldrudge, project manager, and Maggie Schilling, NTD program manager, will not be joining us for today. Our contact data is provided, so if you'd like to jot that down, please do so. If you do not know who your analyst is, it is displayed within the NTD safety program on the summary view, or you can call any of us to find out who your analyst is, or we'll be happy to answer your questions ourselves. We'll also be providing this information at the end of the presentation. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, getting some feedback in the chat box that they're having trouble hearing you, you're, you're kind of low. Oh, OK. Let me try adjusting my headset. Is this a little bit better? Um, anyone? I'm looking to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but multiple no, people okay. have been saying that. Uh, people are saying yes, that that's better. OK, I'll try and speak okay, sorry. <laughs> clearly and loudly. <laughs> OK. All right, so first we'll have a brief overview of the NTD program, then we'll discuss the website and show you how to navigate the system. In 1974, Congress established the National Transit Database Program as a means to collect information and statistics on transit systems in the United States. The first data was collected in 1979 with paper reports. 
Since then, the NTD has evolved into the nation's primary source of information and statistics on transit systems. All modes of transportation are included in NTD data collection. Agencies that are recipients or beneficiaries of urbanized area program, program funds, uh, 5307 and 5311, are required to report data with some exceptions. Both public and private providers are encouraged to voluntarily report, as this will increase the federal allocation to that UZA. All reporters designated as full reporters are required to report monthly safety and security data meeting event thresholds. Agencies designated as small systems or rural and tribal reporters report safety and security data on an annual basis. Agencies who have requested a reporting waiver due to a significant natural disaster are not required to report during the period of the waiver. The data reported to NTD is used to provide industry performance reports to Congress and other federal agencies and departments and is used to factor federal funding allocations for the UZAs, which was over $8 billion last year. The NTD data is also used to direct, support, and improve other FTA program initiatives, such as the State Safety Oversight Program. The data is also used to generate analyses of trends in transit safety and security. Safety and security data is published on a monthly basis and viewed by federal agencies, state agencies, transit systems, media, or any other interested party. Published data can be found on the NTD website under the NTD data link. There are two products there for safety and security. One is called the Safety and Security Time Series data, and the other one is the Safety and Security Major Only Time Series. Your username is your e email address in lowercase in the system. There are six access, access levels for reporting NTD data. The agency's user manager establishes a person's role in the system. The user manager is also the point of contact if you need to have your user role changed to get a different access level in the system. The CEO, CEO designate, and NTD contacts have the highest level of access and full functionality to include NTD annual forms, monthly ridership, and safety and security data. The main difference between the CEO and the NTD contacts uh, is that they can submit agency certification forms on an annual basis. NTD editors, shown in the system just as editor, are the next level. They can edit annual forms and can submit monthly ridership and safety and security forms. The safety contact can create, edit, delete, save, and submit safety, safety and security forms. Safety editors, however, can create, edit, and save, but they cannot submit data and they cannot delete reports. And then safety viewers are the lowest access. Safety viewers can only view data. None of the safety contacts can change annual or ridership data. A person must be uniquely identified in the system in only one role. The designated contacts are responsible for reporting data accurately and responding to questions submitted about submitted data. The designated safety and NTD contact will receive the automated late notices and monthly reminders that go out around the 20th of the month. The persons whose email address is displayed under last modified user on the reports will receive reports or forms that are returned for questions or changes. Users can change their passwords as often as they like, but the system requires a new password every 60 days. Passwords must be at least 12 to 20 characters and comprised of at least one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, one number, and or a special character, any three out of those four. If a user has not been used for, if a user ID has not been used for 60 days, the system will lock that user ID. If you get locked out, you can click on the reset password link located beneath where you enter in your login. If you forget your password, and you're not locked out, you'll see a forget password link rather than the reset password link. 
And please note when you request that password reset or, pass, or, or, or the forgot password, uh, you'll be sent an email within a few moments, and that email is only good for 15 minutes. So if you're resetting your password, you want to be ready and, and be looking for that email. On March 18, 2016, FTA launched a new website which contains the link to the NTD data. This is a snapshot of the NTD page on the FTA website. Please notice the link to the NTD reporting tool on the right. Also, on the left-hand side, you'll notice several links which, are going, which we're going to review on the next presentation, next slide, excuse me. The NTD home page contains a variety of links and resources. The About NTD section contains an overview of the NTD program, contact information, and help desk contact information. The NTD data section provides access to historical and current annual data, monthly ridership data, and safety and security time series files, as we just mentioned. These time series files, again, hold statistical information uh, on the safety and security aspects of reporting. Under Reference Materials, you'll find the NTD Glossary, the Policy Manuals, Internet Reporting Guide, Quick Reference Guides, also information on training and conferences, presentations, webinars, and an explanation of all the forms used in NTD reporting. When you click on the Report Tool link, the first screen that appears is depicted here on the left-hand side. Once you click on Agree to the disclaimer, the boxes for you to enter your username and password are presented. If your username is a business email, your, excuse me, your username is your business, business email address, and again, you'll see that reset password or forgot password link right beneath there. Once you complete the login, this is a snapshot of the first screen you will see. You will notice there are menu options in the blue bar across the top. The default screen you just saw was the News menu option. Here you'll find a variety of announcements and items of interest. The next menu option is the Tasks menu, which shows you how many tasks are in your queue. Tasks are things that you need to do. For example, one of the tasks you may have is to manage and deem pending any pending or incomplete safety and security reports. This is when you leave a report without saving. You just close it talk more about that later. The records menu is where you'll go most of the time. This is where you'll go to select the safety and security reporting package. <clears throat> um, the home screen, uh, when you're navigating around, I'm sorry, I thought I was skipped a screen. I did skip a screen. Okay, so, uh, no, we did talk about records. I apologize, uh, getting ahead of myself. The reports tab will display any reports that are available to you. One such report would be the historical lookup report, and this is where you go to look up safety and security the data that you've reported in past years, for example, in 2015 and, and prior at this point. In 2017, excuse me, in 2018, we, in 2017 we launched a new report called the Rate Compared to Industry Rate Report. And this report is used to compare your agency's incident, injury, and fatality rates against the industry average. And finally, the action menu item is used to address, to uh, add new users in addition to other user actions that can be performed there. So that concludes the menu options. As I mentioned, the records tab is where safety and security reporters will go most of the time. To report safety and security data, you would click on the NTD Safety Package link. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you click on my, uh, the Safety Packages link, you'll have access to two reporting packages, one for 2016 and one for 2017. Now that's right now. In January, of course, when we launch the new package for 2018, the 2016 package will close, and you'll have 2018 and 2017 available. Safety packages give you access to all the safety and security reporting forms. The SNS-20 CEO certification form, 
which we're going to go into in more detail later. Each of these we will. Um, the SNS-30 security configuration form to report the number and type of personnel. Your SNS-40 major event forms for detailed information on collisions and that type of event. And then your non-major monthly summary report for reporting single injury safety events and non-major fires. Safety and security analysts review each report submitted for accuracy. The analyst will contact the NTD reporter by a, phone, by a phone or by email for questions for late or incomplete reports, as well as for outstanding event notifications that we may have. The various forms and reports have deadlines. The SNS 50 forms are due on the last day of each month for the previous month's data, except for commuter rail mode. For example, the October report is due by November 30th. The NTD system sends automated late remi uh, email reminders on the 20th of each month, I'm sorry, not late notices, the automated uh, email reminders on the 20th of each month. This is not a late notice. This is just a reminder to report your data. The NTD system does also send out late notices on the 1st and the 5th of each month. Please note that a report that has been created and saved but not submitted is considered late. When late notices are sent, it's quite common for analysts to receive phone calls from reporters saying that they know that they finished their report. And that's often true. However, if you did not click on the submit, you do not see a submit date in the submit column, then the system is going to generate the late notice. So if you get the late notice, please do go in and check to be sure that your report is complete and has a submit date. On the 15th of the month, if the data is still outstanding, FTA initiates delinquent reporter process and adds the agency to the FTA's failure to report list. At this point, the safety and security analyst will contact you to determine if there are extenuating circumstances why the report cannot be submitted. <coughs> Excuse me. Failure to report required data can have severe consequences. A failure to re <coughs> Excuse me. A failure to report can be submitted by an analyst to FTA if an agency does not submit their SNS 50s and the yearly the year end CEO certification um, within 45 days, if it's considered 45 days late. <clears throat> also, delinquent reports uh, are incomplete SNS 40s that do not comply with reporting reporting requirements, or failures to respond to analysts' uh, validation inquiries. Okay, so we're going to take a brief moment here and see if you have any questions thus far before we continue on. Some are typing questions, so we'll hold on for just a moment. Okay, so someone asked if they're uh, interested in the due date of the SNS-40s. Yes, we are going to cover it, but we can still talk about it right now. SNS-40s are due within 30 days of the date of the event. So unlike uh, the non-major data, which is due at the end of the following month, it's 30 days, 30 days from the date of that event. Now, if it's late, you don't get penalized um, until it gets, you know, crazy late, uh, and we know about the event. But uh, we do encourage you to get it within, get it in within the 30 days. A disclaimer when you're logging off. I'm not familiar with that. Um, Summer James, um, I know you guys work on help desk. Have you seen questions about this? I didn't know that there was a disclaimer when you log off. I don't get one, so I'm just questioning. No, I'm not familiar with that either. Uh, okay, uh, Jocelyn, yeah, perhaps you could. Actually. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, perhaps you could email this with us. Maybe you could take a screenshot of this and email it to any of us, and we can take a look at that. I, I'm just not familiar with the disclaimer. 
Uh, James, yes, it is a rolling date. So if your event happened on the 5th of, of September, it's going to be due by October 5th. If it happened on the 20th of, of November, it's going to be due by December 20th. You bet you're right. The, the deadlines haven't changed. Uh, the only things that have changed within the system are the things that we're going to cover on the uh, reporting changes, which is coming up shortly. Okay, we'll continue to monitor the chat box as we go through, but we're going to continue on with the presentation. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, safety and security setup and navigation. Safety and security packages automatically generated at the commencement of the new calendar year based on the agency's submitted annual kickoff report or, or based on the agency's annual submitted kickoff report if it opens up some other time rather than at the beginning of the year. Modes and types of services available in the safety module are determined by the agency's P20 profile form. If you see any changes to the modes or types of services other than what you expect, uh, please feel free to contact the person in your agency that does annual report submitting, or of course, you can contact any of us and we'll be happy to look into that for you. Please do not attempt to modify the P20 profile yourself, as changes made there can affect all aspects of reporting, including affecting your annual reports, the monthly ridership reports, and so on. So please don't modify that P20. Just contact your annual reporter in your agency or one of the safety and security analysts, or the help desk, for that matter. Okay, to access your reporting form, as a reminder, you would click on Records, and then you would click on NTD Safety Packages, and choose the year in which you want to report. When you complete those steps, steps the Safety Summary View is displayed. You see a confirmation of the reporting year, your agency's ID number and name, your validation analyst's name and email address, and your agency's, uh, and the reporting year, the start year and end. This is, this is always a calendar year because it's talking about safety and security and not your annual fiscal year. Below that, you will see the form name filter box. That's this long box here with the arrow in this. The filter box allows you to filter out so that you can see only a specific type of form displayed below in the table. So I could choose in this form name to choose just my SNS 30s or just my SNS 50s or just my SNS 40s, whatever I want to appear in the table below. You can also sort anything in this table by any of the columns. So by clicking on any of these column headings, it's going to sort that data in that um, order. And of course, if you click twice, then it's going to reverse sort. So this is a, a great way to help you find your reports. If you know you just submitted a report today, you can s and sort by submit order, reverse order, and it'll come up with the ones that you did today. It's a great way to find your, your reports, especially once agencies have quite a few reports. You can also use the browser's find feature, excuse me, by doing a control F and enter the number of the major report that you might be looking for. However, you must be viewing the right page in order to find that report if you have multiple pages of the reports. The uh, report table holds uh, 50 line items. Remember that at this point, you can't open any of these forms or reports on this screen. This is just a summary view. If you actually want to edit any data, you must first click on the NTD Safety Forms button located in the upper right-hand corner. The NTD Safety Forms button is used to access the dashboard where you can create a new report, edit, or review existing reports. You can use the filter box, as I mentioned on, uh, on the previous screen. The dashboard also has a filter box, again, so that you can filter only the types of forms that you want to view. And just like on the summary view, the dashboard also allows you to sort your columns by any column heading that you choose to sort by. Once you find the report that you want to, to review or revise, you click on the checkbox adjacent to that 
form. And then you go over there, either to the top or the bottom and click on the View Form button. That opens the existing report. When you're finished with the dashboard, you'll want to remember to click on Close, or the system will create a task for you to close the dashboard. This is a snapshot of the dashboard. It looks similar to the safety summary view, as I mentioned. Um, again, to open a report, you would identify the report here. You'll see these links are in blue. And you can click on that report. There's, there'll be an adjacent uh, um, checkbox there where you can click and then click on your View Form button. And then here you have uh, a new button that your, is your file SNS40 button. This is where you create new major event reports. Okay, so before we get into the SNS 20s, I'm going to turn this over to James and let you listen to someone else talk for a little while. James? Thanks, Ann. Okay, so the SNS 20 CEO certification form, the CEO or his or her designee uh, to its attestation to the accuracy of the major and non-major safety and security data for the previous calendar year. The form becomes available in January and the previous year's safety package when the new year launches. The form automatically calculates data from submitted reports for the year. Un unsubmitted data is not included. The form is due by the end of February of the following year and only a person logged in as the CEO or CEO delegate can submit the form. Data reporters or the CEO should review their data to ensure it matches to the data in the SNS-20. Also, you can check that all safety data reports are submitted. You may add or delete SNS-40s or edit SNS-50 data. There are two reports that can be accessed and printed to, the assist, to assist the CEO in validating the number of reported events, the number of injuries and fatalities. These reports will be located on the Reports tab. They are the Major Incidents Summary by Mode Service Report and Minor Incidents Summary by Mode and Service Report. These reports provide a modal breakdown of events. Agencies should also use any in-house reports available to help verify the data. Click the Confirm box adjacent to the data, then the CEO can click on Submit. Once the form is submitted, it cannot be resubmitted, but understand that an added or deleted data item will automatically be recalculated in the form. This is a snapshot of the SNS-20 CEO certification form. Please note, that the CEO name and title show that this is a screenshot of our test, excuse me, please note that the CEO name and the title in this screenshot uh, is of our test database and does not reflect actual data reported by this agency. Uh, now we'll talk about the SNS-30. The SNS-30 security configuration form collects the number and type of security personnel employed or contracted by your agency. The SNS-30 form is completed once at the beginning of the calendar year, and you are not required to update this form during the year. All SNS-30s must be completed or and submitted to enable reporting. If you cannot create or edit an SNS-40 or 50, is because one or more of the SNS-30s is not submitted. This is a screenshot of the SNS-30 security configuration form. Again, this does not represent actual data for the agency shown. Notice you have a place to enter the primary number of security personnel and the total number of security personnel, which is the primary and secondary added together. Do not leave either of these boxes blank. You'll also see the seven types of security personnel with two columns to identify the type as primary or secondary.
The primary security force is the one that routinely responds to events in or on transit property and is assigned to patrol agency property. For the use of local police non-contracted, report a count of zero. The secondary security force is the one or ones that occasionally respond or respond when primary force requires assistance. Again, for the use of local police non-contracted, use a count of zero. The number of personnel is reported in full-time equivalent hours. So one full-time equivalent equals one person working a 40-hour week or 2,080 hours per year. You'll want to prorate the number of personnel if the person works only part-time providing transit security or they provide security for more than one mode. One SNS-30 is completed for each mode. Be careful not to double count personnel. So totaling line two from each SNS-30 form should equal the total number of personnel. For example, an MBPT mode, the total number is one and a half. The LRDO mode, the total number is three. And for the DRDO mode, the total number is 0.5. This means the total security force for that agency would be five full-time equivalency. If your security force covers multiple modes, you may use any reasonable method for determining full-time equivalency. That may be modal ridership or the number of employees covering a mode. If an agency contracts for security and pays a monthly fee based on services used, they should determine full-time equivalents based on the previous year's total hours worked. NTD allows for only one primary personnel type. If your agency has more than one type of security personnel it considers its primary, report the security force with the largest number of personnel as the primary and the smaller force as secondary. For further information on the SNS-30, please see the Safety and Security Policy Manual or Safety and Security Internet Reporting Manual on the NTD website or ask your analyst for assistance. This concludes review of the SNS-30 form. All right, now we'll talk about a few 2018 reporting revisions. The definition of a reportable event has been expanded to include events occurring on transit infrastructure and events that involve transit-related maintenance activities that may not be on transit property. Historically, we have collected events in the rail yard and maintenance injuries, but this was not defined in the wording of a reportable event. The clarification also expands on types of events that are not to be reported. Specifically, you see that this excludes events that occur off transit property where persons, vehicles, or objects come to rest on transit property after the event. We will provide some examples as we go through the presentation. The evacuation description has been clarified to ensure that self-evacuations are also to be due are also due to a life safety situation or an evacuation to the right of way. This is a low impact change. While previous guidance did not limit self evacuations to a life safety situation or an evacuation to the right of way, we found there was only one instance where this was not the case. You may have already noticed or uh, that the suicide checkbox on the injury form has been changed to read attempted suicide. Now we'll look at non-major SNS-50 reporting. The, defini the definition of a reportable event is a safety or security event occurring on transit right-of-way or infrastructure at a transit revenue facility, at a maintenance facility, 
during a transit-related maintenance activity or involving a transit revenue vehicle. These safety events must meet the single injury only threshold and are related to falls, electric shock, etc. Multiple injury incidents are bumped up to a major report. The SNS-50 form also collects the number of non-major fires where there was not an evacuation, injuries, fatalities, or substantial damage, but that still required suppression. Some exclusions mo most applicable to the non-major events occurring are events occurring at bus stops or shelters not on transit-controlled property unless boarding or lighting, and OSHA events occurring in administrative buildings. A complete list is included in the table shown earlier. The form is automatically generated for each mode or, and type of service at the beginning of each month. This form is required to be completed even if there was a major event for the month if they captured different event types, and even if there is no data to report for the month. To recap, for submitting other safety events, you are entering the number of occurrences and the matching number of injured parties. Remember that injured means that they were transported away from the scene for med medical attention regardless of whether they appear injured or not. Do not include people who were not transported away from the scene for medical attention. Here are several examples of injuries reported on the SNS-50. A passenger is thrown out of the seat due to a bus maneuver. Improper wheelchair securement and rider is injured. Transit vehicle door closing on an arm, leg, backpacker clothing, and the person is transported. A person walking into the side of a stopped vehicle and is injured. This would be considered a fall. This is a snapshot of the SNS-50 monthly summary report. Two of the categories for injuries on the SNS-50 form relate to securement issues. Securement issues are those related to an injury resulting from improper securement of a mobility device such as a wheelchair or scooter. So they are reported as other in vehicle securement issue. The other category is for other in vehicle, not a securement issue. These are trips, slips while on the vehicle, or for being thrown from a seat during a vehicle maneuver. If no events occurred for a mode and month, open the appropriate SNS-50 form and choose the checkbox adjacent to no data to report, then save and submit the report. Remember, do not include injuries due to collisions or any other major event type. Again, reports are due at the end of the following must, month and must be completed and submitted by the due date to avoid an automatic late notice. The SNS-50 can be modified at any time. Some reporters like to event enter events as they occur during the month. For these reporters, they can modify the form and save and close the form after each change. Your validation analyst reviews each report for accuracy. If we have any questions, we may return the report to you, call or email you with our concern. If the return feature is used, the user ID under the last modified user column will receive the email. This is a snapshot of the SNS-30 monthly summary report with an analyst comment or question. So not only do you receive an email with the issue, but when you open the report, you will be able to see our question or concern there as well. Uh, now we'll take a break for any questions that you may have. Uh, Zara, that's correct. Uh, any injury 
uh, is only reported to NTD if they're transported from the scene. Um, Frederick, uh, let's see, you said, how is a passenger thrown from a secured wheelchair after declining? The lap belt and shoulder harness classified. Uh, well, it's still a, it's, um, I think you meant over, uh, it's, it's called not, um, it's called a, a securement, uh, not a securement issue, I apologize. Um, so if anyone is tossed out of their seat, it doesn't matter if, if uh, it's not talking about the securement issue is not talking about the the uh, the lap belt. Securing it, the, is talking about the securement of the wheelchair itself, so the the wheel locks or whatever is in place to keep the wheelchair itself from moving. So on your SNS 50, if they're thrown out of that wheelchair, they would report it as not a securement issue. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Skylar, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, is there an electronic form or PDF? Is this for the SNS 50? Um, there are. You can open up any of the SNS 50s, and uh, you know, including a blank one, because they're generated automatically at the beginning of the month, and take a snapshot of that. You know, just a, a regular screenshot of that, um, and send it to the. Uh, uh, purchase transportation providers. However, for the major event forms, all of the forms are different, uh, or at least the first three score, sc screens are the same, but then after that, they differ depending on the type of the event, whether it's a, a collision or a security event or what the case may be. So it's, it's pretty hard to take a snapshot of those. Uh, though you could have, if you did have a completed SNS 50, uh, excuse me, 40, a major event form, you could print that out or PDF it uh, if you want it to send it to the providers. You can also give them this presentation again because this shows you snapshots of all of the screens um, that we go through in the system. Uh, Ryan, we do have a couple of examples of um, OSHA events, uh, if I remember correctly, as we get more into the presentations a little bit later, as, if we're talking about major events. Um, outside of that, you know, basically it's like, you know, administrative people such as yourself that might cut their hand, fall down the stairs, you know, things like that. Those are excluded. Um, administrative buildings in the rail yard. Well, it's still an admin building, as far as I can tell. We're, we're, we're talking about events in the rail yard. We're really talking more about the yard itself or maintenance buildings. OK, I'm sorry. Yes, Emmanuel. Hi, Emmanuel. Uh, securement and not securement issues on the SNS-50. Um, securement issue, again, when it says securement issue, that pertains to the securement of the wheelchair device or mobility device itself. So if the wheelchair device is improperly secured and the van you know, goes around a, a corner and the wheelchair rolls around and the person is injured that way, that's reported as a securement issue. If a person falls out of the seat or is thrown out of the wheelchair or mobility device, then that's not a securement issue. Thank you, Allie. I'm glad you find the quick reference guide helpful. We don't have them here, but if you want a uh, on this, we, we probably should have put them on here so you all could download them. But um, if you need a quick reference guide, which is just a one page at a glance, here's what's reportable and when, uh, piece of paper basically, just contact any of us after the webinar and we'll be happy to send you those quick reference guides. All righty. Um, so now that we've completed uh, those forms, I'm going to turn this next section over to Tim. Thank you, James. Um, now we're going to take a look at the major event reporting.
So let's discuss the applicability and reporting thresholds in more detail. The definition of a reportable event is unchanged from 2016. A reportable event is a safety or security event occurring on transit right-of-way or infrastructure, at a transit revenue facility, at a maintenance facility or rail yard, during a transit-related maintenance activity, or involving a transit revenue vehicle. These clarifications are in bold text. Um, the exclusions have also been clarified. Uh, the, the change, um, the main change here is the inclusion of events that occur off transit property where affected persons, vehicles, or objects come to rest on transit property after the event. The remainder of events are, we, the remainder of events we have not collected in recent years, but information came more from guidance rather than the rule. Continuing, we have fatalities, including suicides, one or more persons immediately transported for medical attention, such as an injury, um, property damage equal to or exceeding $25,000, Evacuations of a transit facility or vehicle for life safety reasons or evacuations to the rail right-of-way, including both transit, official-directed, customer self-evacuation, are all reportable regardless of any other threshold. A collision involving a transit roadway revenue vehicle, which results in either the transit roadway vehicle or non-transit roadway vehicle being towed away from the scene regardless of severity of damage. Here are a few types of events that are not reportable. OSHA events in administrative buildings are still excluded. Medically related issues such as seizures, heart attacks, and pregnancy. An operator on break is injured while crossing the street. This is not reportable because the employee is not on transit property. And a transit police vehicle or transit supervisor's vehicle is involved in a collision, meeting a threshold that is not reportable unless the vehicles are on transit property. Events at bus stops that are not on transit owned or controlled property are not reportable unless the event involves a transit vehicle or boarding or lighting a vehicle. Two people who are standing when the transit vehicle starts moving fall and are injured. These are reportable. Transit vehicle at a service stop involved in a collision that meets a threshold is reportable. A person is waiting at a bus stop and is hit by a car is not reportable since the person was not on transit controlled property. Um, and an assault or robbery at a bus stop is not reportable because it did not occur on a transit property. However, if the person is boarding or lighting the vehicle at the time, it is then reportable. So part of the event definition stated involving a transit revenue vehicle. So if a deadheading or out-of-service vehicle is involved in a collision, or there is a fire in a bus garage meeting a reporting threshold, these are reportable. Maintenance-related activities are included in reporting. Here you see a few examples of maintenance-related activities that are reportable, such as a mechanic falls into the pit resulting um, in a fatality, maintenance employee is hit by a vehicle in the yard and is injured, less severe injuries to maintenance workers are captured on the SNS-50 monthly summary report, along with the non-major injuries to passengers and patrons. NTD also collects non-transit collision incidents, such as an accident in tr a transit parking lot that meets a threshold. A few examples are a private vehicle collides with a pedestrian or vehicle requiring immediate transport for medical treatment, or a private vehicle collides with transit property, such as a station or pantograph tower, resulting in total damage of $25,000 or more, or any other threshold. These would both be reportable. Talk about fatalities. Uh, 
A fatality is a death confirmed within 30 days of a transit-related event. This includes transit-related suicides. Please do not include deaths resulting from illness or natural causes or found deceased or persons found deceased on transit property where it is not a result of a collision or suicide. For injuries, an injured person is a person transported immediately away from the scene for medical attention. This includes transport by ambulance or transport by private vehicle. However, a person walking away from the scene for medical attention is not considered injured. The general rule of thumb that we have is if a person is transported, they are reported. Um, please note that the injury thresholds are different between rail and non-rail modes. For information on rail modes, please attend the training webinar um, and consult the policy manual or other guidance. Uh, that training webinar will be this Thursday. To provide a little further clarification on injuries, um, medical attention must be sought without delay after the event. Medical care that is sought hours after or days after an event does not meet the threshold and they are not included. Medical attention must be administrated at a location other than where the event occurred. This means that minor first aid given at the scene is not considered injured. And medical attention due to illness should not be reported. For example, a passenger on the bus has a seizure and is transported to the hospital. This is not reportable. All right, the property damage threshold. Events with total, actual, or estimated property damage equal to or exceeding $25,000 are reportable. Property damage includes transit vehicle and non-transit vehicle damage, damage to transit stations, bus stop signs, and shelters, if applicable, and the cost of non-transit property, uh, private property, such as buildings and fences, is included, and also the cost of clearing wreckage is included. NTD only re requires only general ballpark estimates, and you may use a variety of methods for estimating, such as blue book values, repair amounts or insurance estimates, established standard property damage estimates for specific event types or severity of damage. Uh, many transit agencies do create their own list of standardized costs. Um, or estimates may be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Estimated damage excludes personal property such as laptops, cell phones, investigation costs, medical claims, or litigation. Uh, the property damage must always be reported on the SNS-40 regardless of the amount, including zero damage that is still reported. If the cost is confirmed as zero, uh, please enter a statement in the event description. Otherwise, the analyst will return the report requesting such a statement. If there is a collision involving a transit roadway revenue vehicle, which results in either the transit vehicle or a non-transit roadway vehicle being towed, the event is automatically reportable regardless of any other threshold. This is limited to roadway vehicles and therefore excludes ferry boats and trains. For example, a transit bus and a car collide. There are no injuries or fatalities and the property damage is only $1,000 but the car is towed from the scene, so now the event is reportable. The towaway is not based on the severity of damage, so if a roadway vehicle is towed, it is reportable, regardless of how severe the damage on the vehicle towed is. All evacuations for life safety or to the rail right-of-way Right-of-way, of course, refers to rail mode, um, are reportable including or directed <clears throat> or customer, including directed or customer self-evacuation. Self-evacuations are where the customers vacate the property without the direction of the transit agency or other authority.
Some examples of life safety reasons are suspicious packages, bomb threats, smoke event, fire, fuel flame, fuel fumes, nos nauseous odors, or a person with a weapon on a transit vehicle. If a bus has a transmission problem and the passengers are evacuated to the sidewalk or shoulder of the road, um, the transmission problem is not a potentially unsafe situation and therefore this is not a reportable evacuation. Okay, to create a major event report, you'll log into NTD 2.0 and select the records menu option. Then you will choose my NTD safety packages link and choose the year you want to report in. From there, you will click on the NTD safety forms button located in the upper right corner to access the dashboard. To add a new report, just click on the file new SNS 40 button. All right, so if you have an event to report that includes two or more transit modes from your own agency, um, in order to choose which mode to report under, if the event evolved rail mode and a non-rail mode, you will automatically choose the rail mode. For example, one of your light rail vehicles and one of your buses collide at a grade crossing, you report the incident only once under the light rail mode. If the event is between two non-rail modes, you're going to use the predominant use rule, which is typically based on ridership. For example, if a bus or paratransit vehicle collide, report the event under the bus mode since it has a higher ridership. The first two screens will act as a wizard to help determine if the event meets reportable thresholds. Screen one captures the date of the event the mode and the type of service, and it captures the event type. Here we have a snapshot of the setup screen one. You can see where you enter the date, the mode, and then the event type based on, uh, through a selection of radio buttons. The setup screen one event types, the first and most common is a collision. This includes suicides or attempted suicides where there is vehicle impact. For an event to be considered a fire, there must be flame suppression, non-fire smoke events, or the smell of something burning which meet another threshold are reported as other safety events. Next, for an event to be considered a hazardous material spill, it, is, it not only has to meet a threshold, but the situation would have had to require specialized cleanup, such as a hazmat team. Acts of God refer to acts of nature, such as hurricanes, flood, tornado, snow, and ice storms. Also, other natural events, such as lightning. There are two categories for security events. They are system security events such as arson, bomb threats, burglary, suspicious package, vandalism, etc. Basically these are events that are going to affect the entire transit system. And then there are personal security events such as assault, robbery, homicide, rape, larceny, etc. Um, these are events that affect one or more persons. Just as with other event types, the event must meet a threshold. Suicides or attempted suicides that are not collisions are reported here as personal security events. Finally, the last event, a type we ha event type we have is other safety events. These events are those that don't fit into other categories but do meet a reporting threshold. This might be an evacuation due to smoke or a fall resulting in a fatality. You will notice that injuries of two or more people has an asterisk. For an other safety event, two or more injuries are required if that is the only threshold. Therefore, if there is only one injury and then another threshold must exist, such as a fatality or an evacuation. The 
second setup screen asks you a series of questions, some of which are based on the mode and or the type of service you are reporting. This is to, to determine the reportability of the event and the subforms that need to be generated. This is only a list, then we will cover each more in detail. Uh, first is the number of injuries and, fat and or fatalities, the total estimated property damage amount, the screen asks you about evacuation threshold. If the event type is a collision, then you are also asked the tow-away threshold question. You will also be asked if a transit vehicle was involved, which determines if the transit, if this is a transit or non-transit collision. This here is a snapshot of the setup screen two for non-rail mode collisions. So you see it starts personal information about fatalities or injuries, then property damage, and the event details where it asks about evacuations, uh, transit vehicles involved, and tollways. As I mentioned, if you choose collision on screen one, then screen two captures if there were transit vehicles involved in the event. Select yes if this is true, which includes purchased transportation vehicles as the transit vehicle since you are reporting for this service. You would select no when the collision involves a private vehicle on transit property when uh, no other transit vehicle is involved. Based on the selection you have made and the questions you have answered, the system will respond accordingly. If the event is reportable as a major event, the basic information screen will appear. If the event is not reportable as a major event, the system will generate a message that the event is not reportable and ask if you want to continue. At this point, you can edit the selections on setup screen two in case you have answered a question incorrectly, which may have made the event seem not reportable. If the event meets the criteria for a major event, the basic information screen will appear next. The basic information screen displays the date you already selected. When entering the time, be sure to use AM or PM designations, even if you use military or 24-hour clock format. The approximate or actual location of the event, the geographic location, latitude and longitude, is required. You are permitted to Enter numbers, a decimal point, and a negative symbol for the longitude. Please use a minimum of four decimal places. If you do not have the coordinates, you can use a variety of internet resources. One such site is latlong.net. This is what that website looks like. This is what we use when we are checking the latitude and longitude. As you can see, there is a box to enter the physical address. Uh, or the station name or milepost, and the system will display the coordinates and latitude and longitude for you. Basic information screen also captures the event description. The description should be concise but descriptive so that the analyst can understand what occurred, how it occurred, and should include the number and type of injuries or any fatalities, but please do not include personal data such as names and license numbers. Also, please refrain from using codes such as IV to refer to a vehicle <clears throat> or form including the transit vehicle uh, as vehicle one or vehicle two. The analyst has to determine who hit whom and how, and not everyone refers to vehicle one as the transit vehicle. Notice this description clearly identifies the transit vehicle. If you want to take a look at that description, uh, that ex description example that's posted. Um, the description box can hold 2,000 characters. If you exceed the 2,000 character limit, when you click on next, a message will pop up that it says you have exceeded the limit and you will not be able to continue to the next screen until you reduce the number of characters. Here we have provided a, an example of a comprehensive narrative that is under 2,000 characters.
The last piece of information is the name and phone number of someone to contact for additional information regarding the event. You do not need to enter the name of the person if they are already the designated safety contact. The basic information screen is also the first screen that the progress bar appears on. The bar shows you how many subsections you have to complete in your progress thus far in the reporting process. So there is the basic information screen for you, and you can see the start of the progress bar at the top, where it's filled blue all the way up through basic information. All right, so to talk about collision screens, first we'll review these in detail. Um, collision screens will vary slightly depending on the mode. There are up to four screens or subforms that may appear when reporting a transit collision, the collision event information screen, and the collision information screen, the transit vehicle involved information screen. And finally, if another vehicle was involved in the collision, then the other vehicle involved information screen will appear as well. Here we have a snapshot of the collision event screen for non-rail modes. You see it starts with the number of non-rail transit vehicles involved, followed by the location, which you will select via radio button, um, and then the collision width and the number of other vehicles involved. As always, please use other sparingly on these uh, radio buttons as we do not get actual data from them, so use them only if there is no possible selection. Um, available other than other, and then please be informative in the please describe box when using other. So again, the first collision screen is the collision event information screen. For all the modes, this captures information about the number of transit vehicles involved. The answer would always be one unless two transit vehicles from your agency collide. The location of the event, such as transit facility, roadway intersection, roadway grade crossing, bus stop, etc. cetera. Um, and then what did the transit vehicle collide with, uh, such as another vehicle, a person, an animal, a fixed object, so on. And if applicable, the number of other non-transit vehicles that were involved in the collision. There are a few things to keep in mind when reporting collision information. Uh, ramps, streets, highways, and freeways are reported as roadway, not grade crossing or intersection. Please do not select other and type in highway or freeway. Other is used for um, less specific things such as private property or a parking lot. Grade crossings are locations where the rail tracks and vehicular traffic intersect. And a bus or service stop is the appropriate location for modes such as MB, DR, DT, VP, and so on. Parking lot entrances, exits, and driveways are not reported as intersections. Please use the roadway not grade crossing or intersection location. For the collision width selections, a collision with a bicyclist, pedicab, or a person in a wheelchair is reported as a collision with a person. However, scooters, mopeds, and motorcycles, also school buses or dump trucks, are all reported as a collision with a motor vehicle. Please do not select other and type in school bus. This is reported as a motor vehicle. Collision with a transit vehicle is used when two transit vehicles from your agency collide. If you collide with a transit vehicle from another agency, it is reported as a collision with a motor vehicle. In a multiple impact collision scenario, please report the collision with as the first object impacted. For example, a bus collides with a car and then the car hits a building. The collision with selection would be motor vehicle you would include the damages to the building and the, and the vehicle that was struck in the event description.
So let's look at a few examples of how to determine how many other motor vehicles to report. If car one cuts off a bus but no contact is made and the bus goes on to hit car two, the number of other vehicles to report is one because only car two had contact. If car one hits a car two, then car two hits the bus, the number of other vehicles to report is two. Again, both car one and car two had contact. Please note this box is not the total number of vehicles in the collision. It is only the total number of non-transit vehicles involved. So please do not include the transit vehicle in this number. As with other events, a non-transit collision must meet a reportable threshold. Here are a few examples. A privately owned vehicle collides with pedestrian or private vehicle in a transit parking lot. A privately owned vehicle collides with an object, such as a utility pole, in a transit parking lot. Or a privately owned vehicle collides with the transit center itself. The non-transit collision form would appear if you reported a collision that met a threshold, but when asked for transit vehicles involved in the collision, you selected no. This would be appropriate for reporting the collisions on transit property when a transit vehicle was not involved. And this is a screenshot of that form now. So you have a smaller selection for location, and the collision options are as follow, private vehicles, private vehicle with a person, private vehicle with a fixed object, and then again, other. After the collision event information screen, the collision information screen will appear. This is a snapshot of the first part of the collision information screen. So it starts out with the weather, the lighting conditions, the roadway information. The collision information screen captures information about the conditions at the scene. All modes will capture the weather at the time of the collision. Was it raining, clear, snowing, etc.? Under the lighting, the twilight selection is used to refer to both dawn and dusk when it is not fully light or fully dark out. Please be sure your lighting cooperates with your AM or PM time selection on the, information, on the basic information screen. If the collision occurred in a tunnel or indoor facility, please select artificial lighting. Please note the selection is not used to indicate street lights or lights at a platform, only if you are inside. Here are some considerations when reporting the roadway configuration. You would select limited access highway to report an incident, an incident on the freeway. A limited access highway has access, access limited in some way, for example, it may not allow pedestrians or bicycles. Please be sure that the selection is consistent with the location chosen on the collision event information screen. So if you reported roadway intersection on the event information screen, be sure to select intersection or grade crossing on the roadway configuration. If you chose roadway, intersection, or grade crossing, the system will generate two subform sections for the intersection control and the grade crossing control devices, if these are applicable. The first sub option is the grade crossing control device. If the event occurred at a grade crossing, choose the signage or signaling present at the crossing. There is an option for no control device if there is no device or sign. Choose not applicable only if the event did not occur at a grade crossing. This is sa the same is true for the intersection control device section. One of these options must always be not applicable. The location you select on the collision, collision event information screen 
must be corroborated on the roadway configuration selection on the collision information form. So if roadway intersection is chosen as the location on the non-rail collision information screen, the reporter must choose intersection or grade crossing. Then in the grade crossing control device area, choose not applicable because this did not occur at a grade crossing. And in the intersection control device section, choose the appropriate signage, signaling, or lack thereof at this location. So you can see on this screen right here how all three have to be cooperated. So we have intersection or grade crossing as a roadway configuration. And then one of the two below must be not applicable because it can't be both intersection and grade crossing. At this point, we have completed the collision event information screen. The next screen to be presented collects information about the transit vehicle involved. One screen will appear for each transit vehicle involved. So if two buses from the same transit agency collided, you would complete one transit vehicle information form for each bus. The form includes an identifier count and buttons for increasing or decreasing the number of vehicles. This is the non-rail transit vehicle involved screen. So I'll start out with vehicle type, and then the action and the collision type, along with the vehicle manufacturer, transit speed, and fuel type. As mentioned, the form captures the vehicle type, the vehicle action at the time of the collision. Was it stopped, turning, uh, et cetera? This is captured for all modes. And the collision type um, is also captured for all modes. This is the part of the transit vehicle that was hit and is reported from the viewpoint of the transit vehicle. Again, first impact is what we're looking for here. You would also report the actual or estimated speed of the transit vehicle at the time of the collision. Then the transit vehicle manufacturer, which is chosen from a drop-down list of choices. And the vehicle fuel type for non-ferry modes is also chosen from a list of choices. For non-rail mode collisions, the form will also present the question, was this vehicle towed from the scene due to disabling damage incurred as a result of the collision? You will select yes or no accordingly. So let's explore some of the transit vehicle action options. When the transit vehicle is moving into or out of a scheduled service stop, report the action as either making a transit stop or leaving a transit stop accordingly. And report the transit vehicle speed to indicate the vehicle was, in, was moving. Do not choose this option if the vehicle was standing still. If you choose the stopped or parked option, be sure to report the vehicle speed as zero. The vehicle speed must be reported even if it is zero. This diagram here shows the most, of, uh, the most common impact points, which are reported from the point of, the view, the point of view of the transit vehicle. So we can look at the options in more detail. First, we have rear-ended, which means that the front of a vehicle hits the rear of the transit vehicle with its front end. Next is rear-ending, which means that a transit vehicle traveling forward hits the rear of another vehicle. Please do not report this action as head-on or other front impact. Side impact means that the transit vehicle was impacted anywhere on its side, including the door, the mirror, or the tires, with the exception of when a side swipe occurs. Other front impact is used when the front of the transit vehicle is impacted, but not when it would be considered a head-on or rear-ending. An example would be the front corner bumper hits another vehicle or object while turning, not the bumper on the side at the front. 
Likewise, other rear impact is used when the transit vehicle is impacted on the rear, but not when it would be considered rear-ended. An example would be if the transit vehicle was backing up and hit a utility pole. Sideswipe is used when two vehicles are parallel to each other, going in the same or opposite direction, and bump and scrape along the sides of each other. Both vehicles would have to be reported as sideswipe. Please note that sideswipe cannot be the action chosen when you are reporting a collision with a person. Instead, use side impact. When reporting a T-bone or broadside collision, one vehicle is reported as head-on and the other vehicle is reported as side impact. So in the diagram, vehicle number one, the other motor vehicle, would be reported as head-on and the transit vehicle, vehicle number two, would be reported as side impact. Multiple vehicle accidents or chain reaction accidents can be a challenge to report, so remember to consider the first impact or collision type in your analysis. In this diagram, vehicle one would be reported as rear-ending, it's doing the hitting, which means that vehicle two was rear-ended, which then caused vehicle two to be pushed into vehicle three, the transit vehicle, which would also be reported as rear-ended. For the speed, enter the actual speed of the transit vehicle at the time of the collision. If the speed is unknown, you can use the posted speed for that section of the road, and if needed, adjust that speed based on traffic and or road conditions at the time of the incident. Please be sure that your estimated speed corroborates your choice of transit vehicle action. The manufacturer of the transit vehicle is chosen from a drop-down list of choices, including a selection of other, with a place for you to type in the manufacturer should yours not appear. You will also select the transit vehicle fuel type from a drop-down list. The form will also present the question, was the vehicle towed from the scene due to disabling damage incurred as a result of the collision? Answer yes or no accordingly. And that covers all the categories for reporting the transit vehicle information. Now, if you indicated on the collision event screen that another vehicle was involved, the other vehicle information screen will appear. This screen gathers information about non-transit vehicle or vehicles involved in the collision. If more than one vehicle is involved, you will need to complete one other vehicle involved information form for each motor vehicle that was involved. So for example, a transit vehicle causes a multi-car collision with two autos. Two other vehicle involved screens would be, will be generated and must be completed. This form will also include vehicle count and buttons for increasing or decreasing the number of other vehicles. Here we have a screenshot of the other vehicle involved screen for non-rail collision reporting very similar to the transit vehicle involved screen. The form collects the type of other vehicle. The form includes an option for non-revenue rail vehicle. Um, the automobile option would be used for both cars and passenger vans, like a Dodge Caravan, for example. And the action or physical movement of the other vehicle at the time of the collision is also collected on this form. Just as when reporting the transit vehicle collision type, you are indicating the part of the vehicle that was hit from the point of view of the other vehicle. This concludes the collision information screen. If your event includes injury or fatality, you will need to complete a screen for each person. The form also includes a person count and buttons for increasing or decreasing the number of people. 
The person type location categories are divided into two groups, persons outside the vehicle and persons inside the vehicle, so be sure to choose carefully. We often see collision reports where the transit vehicle operator is reported as being outside the vehicle during the collision. Transit vehicle rider is the correct choice for passengers boarding or alighting the transit vehicle. The form also includes an attempted suicide and a trespasser checkbox on the injury form and a suicide and a trespasser checkbox on the fatality form. Please be sure to select the location and the checkboxes accordingly. You may check both the suicide and trespasser boxes as needed. This is a snapshot of the fatality form. And this is one of the injury forms. If the suicide or attempted suicide involved collision with a transit vehicle, the event is reported as a collision with a person. However, if the suicide or attempted suicide did not involve contact with a transit vehicle, then it is reported, uh, reported under the other personal security event type. When you are reporting these events on the injury or fatality form, you will need to check the suicide box or attempted suicide box. If this is checked, um, then we will know that whether it was reported as a collision or other person full security event, that it was a, a suicide or attempted suicide. Um, you may also select the trespasser in addition to the suicide or attempted suicide uh, box if that is applicable as well. So at this point, we have concluded reporting for collisions. Uh, before we continue on to reporting the other event types and editing reports, um, go on and take a break for any questions you may have. I'm just going to jump in here while people are thinking of their questions. Uh, we just had one come in from Nancy, and she asked how come the safety and security data is not available under the agency profile. Um, Nancy, that's actually something we're working on doing, is doing safety and security profiles. They are not ready at this time, um, but we're hoping that sometime in 2018 they will be available. However, you can look at safety and security statistics, as we mentioned earlier, in the two time series files. The reason I jumped in is because we had some questions earlier, and I'm just going to manually go back here to slide 82, because I think that's where some of the confusion may have been. Um, Regarding, I'm sorry, I don't have a quick way to jump uh, without <laughs> risking messing up the presentation. So let me just get over to 82 here. I think that was, yes, okay. Um, so there, I think there may be some confusion about the two or more injuries, one or more injuries, because perhaps it's the way we presented this here. So the threshold is an injury. And for non-rail modes, which is what we're talking about here today, um, the threshold for an injury, an injury means that the person is transported away from the scene for medical attention at that time. Um, so that's one or more people. Now, there's been confusion about where this gets reported, major, non-major, and also want to clarify some things. So if you have, it, it, whether something goes major or non-major depends on what happened. If this is a slip, trip, or fall, they fell down the stairs, somebody fell down the stairs. That's going to get reported as an other safety event. If a person's on the transit vehicle and the transit vehicle stops short but that does not collide anything, that goes on the non-major form, the SMS 50 form, because it's one injury. What this slide is trying to present here is that if that same uh, uh, hard break resulted in two people falling out of their chairs, and again, no collision, it's just a hard break, and two or more people uh, um, fall out of their seats or are thrown out of their seats, as it were, then this bumps that slip, trip, and fall up to a major event. Okay, so that's why this is asterisk this way. So yes, an injury, one injury is a threshold. If it's for a major event, if it's a collision, a fire, a derailment, an act of God, a security event, um, either personal or system safety. 
<clears throat> excuse me, it's only in the case of other safety events where it has to be two or more injured people for it to become an SNS 50. Those single, excuse me, 40, I apologize, SNS 40, your major event. A single injury only goes on the SNS 50 non-major monthly summary report. So hopefully that clears that up. And if it, it doesn't, we will have another question session at the end, um, and you can chat. Or uh, feel free to call any of us just to clarify any points uh, that may be um, unclear as we go through the presentation. Um, and also, somebody named Guest in here, I'm just going to pull back up to her, uh, said something about if you collide with a transit vehicle from another agency. I'm not sure um, if there was a question there. But just in case, I'll try and answer. Um, yes, if you collide, if your bus collides with another agency's bus because they're both running around in the city, then and, and it, the incident me, re, meets a reporting threshold, as we've discussed, then yes, that's reportable. And then under your collision with box, um, you actually choose other vehicle. Um, it's not considered a transit vehicle. It, I understand that it is a transit vehicle, but transit vehicle is used, the transit vehicle option under collision with, is used for reporting your agency reporting collision, colliding, excuse me, with one of your own agency's vehicle. So a demand response vehicle and one of your buses collide, or two of your buses collide, that type of event. OK, so hopefully that helped clear things up a little bit. So are there any other questions? I'm trying to go back and see in the chat box. I have a question about a fire. In the event that the operator assumes there is a fire and either manually activates fire suppression system or uses portable fire extinguisher, but maintenance states that no fire occurred, is it still reportable? Well, uh, there again, Raji, it would have to meet a threshold. So if there was fire suppression, there was flames, flame suppression, either manually or by the, uh, the system, you know, the button, um, it would still have to meet a threshold. You either evacuated the vehicle uh, for this proposed uh, life safety event, um, or there was an injury. Uh, or it met the 25,000, which obviously would not be the case in this scenario, but it would still have to meet a threshold. If it's just smoke or odors and things like that, then, again, still have to meet a threshold. You just don't report it as a fire. And to go on the SNS 50, a fire still has to have suppression, so it would have to actually be flames um, being suppressed. Uh, I don't know if you want me to take this, Mylin. Uh, th that's the reporting threshold that was changed in 2015. All towaways became uh, automatically reportable when we're talking about roadway vehicles. Now, we're not talking about trains, of course. We're only talking about non-rail events. So if your bus and a car collide and the car has a flat tire, uh, for, for example, as a result of this collision, that makes the event automatically reportable. That's the threshold. So if you have historical data that you believe for 2016 or 15 that needs to be changed based on that, then uh, certainly give me or James um, a call, and we can discuss that approach. I see a couple another. more questions are yeah. coming yeah. in. We'll take one or two more before we hand it over to James.
uh, Mike, uh, no. SNS, uh, I want to make this perfectly clear, especially for, uh, well, I take that back. Let me look at this. Disabling damage to make consider disabling damage to be considered to make an SNS-50 into an SNS-40 in a fire or smoke condition. No, because disabling damage has nothing to do with fires. Um, uh, if, if a, the distinction between a major and a non-major fire is, either way, first of all, the fire has to have suppression. If there's no threshold, there's just a small fire that was put out by some means, and there's no threshold involved, then that gets reported on the SNS-50. If there's a threshold involved, evacuation, property damage, $25,000 or more, injury, fatality, then that bumps that fire up to a major SNS-40. Okay, so Bram, uh, SNS-40 includes events at bus stops and at trans vehicles involved, yes. Uh, likewise, SNS-50 used, boarding and lighting as some of the OSINOC entries removed yeah. all trans vehicles too. Come back to Brands. Looks like he's still typing. Passenger vehicle. Okay, uh, Emmanuel. Um, <coughs> yeah, we, we we see this obviously. Um, Obviously, the agency is going to have to make a determination as to whether or not there was or was not impact. Uh, vehicle cameras are always helpful in that scenario, damage to the vehicle, um, whatever the case may be. Uh, if you can't prove that there was a collision, then all you can do is report that as an SNS-50, you know, of someone falling out of their seat for some unknown reason. Um, okay, so trying to go back to Brams there. Okay, I think I, I think I get where you're going, uh, Bram. Um, the boarding and alighting um, caveat that we added there is so that agencies would not have to report events that occur on bus stops that are not on transit-owned property. So I'm just talking about city street bus stops. So if a car runs amok and hits the bus shelter or the bus bench or, as, or whatever the case may be, and people are injured there, we used to collect that kind of data. But uh, many of the transit agencies found a lot of difficulty with this, especially in large um, uh, systems um, where some of it may have happened miles and miles and miles away from uh, the, the uh, transit agency, and they just weren't aware of that, that, that this thing even happened. So it's meant to exclude that unless the person is getting on or off of a vehicle. So. Now a person's stepping off of the, the, the bus and they're alighting or they're boarding and something, some strange event happens, a bicyclist cuts through there on the sidewalk and you know hits the passenger, something like that. Um, now that's going to be captured because when they're boarding or alighting, they're actually considered passengers. So because it's now a passenger, as it were, then, that, then we're going to collect those events. But of course, if you have a transit vehicle that's at a bus stop or anywhere, for that matter, and it has, it's involved in a collision, as long as that collision meets a reportable event, it's reportable. I hope that answers your questions. And of course, anything that, I'm, that we're not answering clearly or I'm not answering clearly, uh, please feel free to contact any of us afterwards, and we'll be happy to um, you know, be more specific and talk to uh, specific incidents that you may be in encountering. Okay, and in the interest of time, I think we're going to move on and, con and complete the presentation, uh, but we'll continue to monitor the chat box. All righty, thank you both. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and talk about the evacuation threshold uh, in greater detail. Evacuations for life safety means there's imminent danger to all people in that environment. Reportable evacuations are also to the rail right of way. 
Each evacuation type include both customer self-evacuations or transit or official direction. Evacuations can be part of almost any event type but are least common in collisions. An evacuation requires all passengers and or employees to depart a transit vehicle or facility. These may be for a safety or security event. This includes events that occur off property but affect the transit, but affect the transit system. For example, a gas leak or fire on adjacent property that caused the RTA to evacuate a nearby station. Evacuations are not uh, if a person is removed from vehicle for medical treatment, removing passengers off a vehicle due to a collision, removing passengers from vehicle to sidewalk due to mechanical breakdown. This is a screenshot of the non-rail mode evacuation subform. The first question on the evacuation event screen is to confirm that the evacuation was for life safety or potentially unsafe conditions. Please do not answer no to the evacuation question. Include a brief description of the evacuation including the cause. The what was evacuated question is used to indicate what was actually evacuated. One choice would be vehicle or vessel, which would mean the, the bus or the demand response vehicle or any other mode. Do not report the location of the bus or, or ferry at the time. The last question asks if this was a self-evacuation. For example, a self-evacuation is when passengers get off the transit vehicle without being told to depart. Once the evacuation subform is generated in a report, it cannot be deleted. So if an evacuation is incorrectly included, the entire report would need to be deleted and a new report entered without the evacuation. Similarly, you cannot add an evacuation subform to a report. Report excuse me. Reporting fires on the SNS-40 that meet one or more major event thresholds. To be defined as a fire, the incident must have had fire suppression equipment or personnel involved to contain the fire and must meet a major event threshold. Without these thresholds, a fire requiring supp suppression is reported on the SNS-50 non-major summary report. Arson is reported on screen one as a system security event, not a fire. The presence of smoke with no fire and no suppression is reported as an other safety event. Here's a screenshot of the fire event detail screen. If the fire is in or on the rail vehicle, including in the engine, wheel area, or anywhere on the outside, this would be reported as in or on vehicle. R report the type or cause of the fire. For the fuel type selection, if you chose the location of the fire as in or on vehicle, then you would report the fuel type of the vehicle. Acts of God are natural and unavoidable catastrophes that affect the transit environment. Select all locations of property damage, injuries, fatalities, and evacuations. You will be able to choose more than one option. For example, the location should indicate the property or properties that were damaged and not the geographic location, such as the name of the city. This is a screenshot of the Act of God screen. When reporting hazardous material spills, the spill must be meet a reportable threshold and have caused imminent danger to life, health, and environment and required specialized cleanup. A couple of examples of what is not reportable as a hazmat event. Oil, brake fluid, etc. from a transit vehicle, not enough fluid to meet a threshold. A bleach container carried onto vehicle breaks open and the vehicle is evacuated due to fumes. 
This is reported as the other safety event because no specialized cleanup was used. This is a screen of the hazardous material spill screen. You see the re you see the report, the location of the spill and the type of material spilled. There are two categories of security incidents. On screen one, system security or personal security events, which must meet one or more of the following thresholds. System security events occur on transit property and affects the transit system as a whole. Personal security events happen to individuals on transit property or those boarding or lighting a, ve a transit vehicle. This is a screenshot of the system security event screen. You may notice that there is an other system security event option on this form. This would be to capture security events that do not meet any other category. For example, shots fired at or objects thrown at a vehicle. This is a screenshot of the personal security event screen. You will notice that there's an other personal security event option on this form as well. The other personal security event would be used to report a suicide or attempted suicide that did not involve contact with a transit vehicle, but instead is due to self-inflicted harm. If contact is made with the transit vehicle, it is reported as a collision. When you are reporting these events on the injury or fatality form, you will check the suicide box. If this is checked on the injury form, or excuse me, now we will have the attempted suicide box on the injury form. You should also select the trespasser selection if applicable. The final major event type is other safety events. This is your miscellaneous category. These events must meet one of the following thresholds. One or more fatalities, two or more injured, property damage of $25,000 or greater, or an evacuation. Please note you may report an other safety event with one injury if another threshold is met. Here are some examples. An evacuation of transit property due to smoke, fumes, noxious odors. A fatality on transit property that is not considered a collision or suicide, a fall or electrocution, etc. Two people thrown from their seats due to a hard break. Three people injured when an escalator comes to an abrupt stop. Other safety events resulting in only a single injury rep reported on the SNS-50 monthly summary form. This is a screenshot of the other safety events report. So at this point, we have completed all our screens for the reportable event types. Let's review saving, submitting, and editing. At any point from the basic information screen on, the system automatically saves your report. So if you close the report without saving or submitting from this point on, these auto-save reports become pending reports, which are stored as a task on the task menu option. When you are ready to complete the report, click on the task menu option, and you will see a listing of each task. Major event report tasks will appear with SNS-40 in the title. Just click on the task and the system will return you to the screen you are on when you close the report. Complete the report and save and submit. Or if you no longer need the report, you can choose delete instead. The system will send you an email that you have a task and will email monthly to manage the task or it will be discarded. Save and submit options appear when you are in view form mode. If you do not see a save or submit button, click on the view form button and scroll to the bottom. Once you click on save, the report is saved and it is given an event number at the top of the report. The report stays open so you may review it. When you submit a report, the report will close the report and return you to the dashboard. 
submitting the report releases the report to the validation analyst for review and comment. It also notifies the analyst that a report has been created, otherwise we may never know one has been created. If we see an unsubmitted report and it is past the due date, uh, we will contact you to submit the report. Please note that unsubmitted reports are excluded from the event. Injury and fatality counts in the SNS-20 CEO certification form. Analysts may return a report to you for questions or to make corrections. The system will send the last modified user one email for each report that is returned. After you make corrections, be sure to save and submit. When reviewing or editing your reports, it is important to learn how to move around the document. Here's a list of the available button tools, uh, though each button may not be available on every form. One shortcut I would like to point out is the jump to section, or the jump to button. This button allows you to jump to a specific screen instead of using next or back buttons. In order to edit the report in a certain section, you must click on this jump to button. The View Form button shows the entire report for review and contains the Jump To buttons and Save and Submit buttons. When you open the report, the first screen is the Setup Summary View. This screen is the only place you can edit the date of the event. Also, if your report does not include any injuries or fatalities, this screen is the only place where you can add them. Then you would click on Next, which displays your report in view form mode. At this point, you can continue to use Next to go to each screen, or you can click on one of the Jump To section buttons. This is also enables the editing mode. As a reminder, Save and Submit only appear in view form mode. A moment ago, I mentioned how to add injuries or fatalities if there are not any in the report. However, if there are injuries or fatalities in the report and you need to increase or decrease the number, you can jump to the injury or fatality section and use the add or delete persons buttons. If you choose delete person, it will delete the person you are currently viewing. Similarly, you can increase or de decrease the number of transit or non-transit vehicles in a report by again jumping to the appropriate section and click on Add Vehicle or Delete Vehicle. Be sure to click on Save and Submit after making your changes. If you delete a report that was not requested by your analyst, please notify your safety and security analyst. Not only do we need to know why the report was deleted, it saves the analyst from trying to locate which report was deleted when our tracking sheets show a different number than the NTD screen. Uh, that concludes the presentation, uh, and we will answer any questions in the chat box. Um, if you don't get a chance, please feel free to call us or send us an email, and we uh, will be sure to clarify any questions for you. Um, Diane wants to know where she can find and download the Quick Reference Guide. Uh, currently, the Quick Reference Guide is not posted on the website. So uh, at this point, you would need to contact one of us, and we'll be happy to send the, uh, the 2018 reporting guides. Please let us know which modes you report for, because there are qu separate, separate guides for non-rail and rail reporting, since the thresholds are different. Uh, I'm going to look into that, though. Someone else asked that question earlier in the chat box, and I'm going to look into 
uh, seeing if we can get those posted or not. Okay, last chance for questions in the chat box. Okay, well, I don't see anyone typing, and uh, you have everyone's emails. Uh, they should be in the handout that you downloaded. <clears throat> so I guess that's it. We'll wrap it up. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. A special thank you to Ann, Tim, and James for their informative presentation. Uh, as a reminder, uh, you will be receiving an invitation to fill out an evaluation for this. Uh, NTI really appreciates your feedback, so if you could just take a few minutes, that would be great. And um, I guess that's it. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>